The general formula of quadratic function is ax squared plus bx plus c, or rather in function notation, fx equals to ax squared plus bx plus c. However, for NSC grade 12, you only need to look at functions of the form fx equals to ax squared. Just as a reminder, these graphs are parabolas, so they come in the shape of a smile or in the shape of a frown both of which have an axis of symmetry in the center of them. The main thing new to learn is related to the domains and range because some interesting things happen with these when you invert them. I'll explain using an example. Let's keep it super simple and look at fx equals to x squared. This is what its graph looks like. Simple smile shaped curve with the y axis as the axis of symmetry and the origin as the turning point. The inverse of this function is square root of x, but we haven't yet confirmed whether it's a function, so it'll just be y inverse for now. This is how its graph is. You can see that it's a reflection of the graph y equals to x squared, but is it a function? To check this, I use the trusted vertical line test. Nope, it already fails the test, so it doesn't qualify as a function. So from this, we can tell that as things are, the inverse of a parabola, and by extension, the inverse of quadratic functions, cannot be a function. However, there is one thing we can do to make the inverse qualify as a function, and that is by limiting the domain of the function. From looking at the graph of the inverse, the main thing that causes the problem is one half of the graph aligning vertically with the other half of it, which happens because when you take the square root of something, you get both a positive and a negative value, which is why this reflects about its axis of symmetry. But if we limit the domain of the original function to just half of it, if for example we limit the domain to only x values less than or equal to zero, this is what it would look like. And therefore, if you reflect this, the inverse looks like, which could be achieved by limiting it to only the negative root values. And this inverse would definitely qualify as a function. Just note that its range is restricted to y values less than or equal to zero. Another option was if we limited the domain of f to only x values greater than or equal to zero. In this case, f would look like, and reflecting this graph gives, which is achieved by limiting it to only the positive root values of x. And this inverse would also qualify as a function whose range is restricted to only y values greater than or equal to zero. I mentioned what happens to the ranges of the inverse functions to bring attention to a certain interesting pattern that's occurring. So for the first case, where the domain was restricted to only x values less than or equal to zero, what happened was the range of the inverse function was restricted to y values less than or equal to zero, meaning that the restriction we applied to the domain of the function, so only values less than or equal to zero, ended up being applied to the range of the inverse function, which also had only values less than or equal to zero. Then for the second case, where we restricted the domain to only x values greater than or equal to zero, the range of the inverse was also restricted to only values greater than or equal to zero. Last thing to notice is, let's go back to the first function with x values less than or equal to zero. The range of the function was restricted to only y values greater than or equal to zero, whereas the domain of the inverse function was also restricted to only values greater than or equal to zero. And for the second function, the range of the function was restricted to only y values greater than or equal to zero, whereas the domain of the inverse function was also restricted to only values greater than or equal to zero. So you can just take a breather. From this whole exposition, there were two things that could be concluded. The first was that when you restricted the domain for the function, this enabled the inverse of the parabola to also be a function. Otherwise, it fails the vertical line test and doesn't qualify. The second thing was that once we did apply this restriction and we had a function of the proper inverse, the domain of the function was equal to the range of the inverse.
and the range of the function equal to the domain of the inverse. This can all be summarized by the following diagram. And with that, we can move on to the final section, exponential functions. An exponential function is an equation of the form y equals to b to the power of x, where b is called the base and x is called the exponent. The base b represents a number. For example, it could be 2, or it could be 50, or it could even be 0, 4. So there's many options. However, it can't just be any number. There's certain restrictions and, depending on the value chosen for b, different kinds of graphs will be produced. The first case is for values of b greater than 1, such as 2. The graph produced for this would look like, for values of b greater than 1, as you increase the value of x, the value of y also increases. So this is an increasing function. And I can confidently call it a function because I can tell that if I were to try the vertical line test on it, the line would always cut the graph at only one point. Another interesting thing about the graph is that the y value will never reach zero. So it would have the x axis as the horizontal asymptote. The next case is for b valued between 0 and 1, so fractions, such as 0, 4. The graph for this case looks like... This is sort of the opposite of the previous case, and as you increase the value of x, the value of y decreases, making it a decreasing function. And this graph also has the x-axis as a horizontal asymptote, but in the positive direction this time. The last case is for b values less than or equal to zero. However, this case is undefined and can't really be analyzed. One important sort of technical thing to clear up right now is that an exponential function with the formula b to the power of x is different than a function with the formula x to the power of b. A x to the power b graph would be something like x squared or x cubed. x squared would just be a quadratic function and x cubed would be a type of cubic polynomial which qualifies as a function. So it's called a cubic function. But the main thing to keep in mind is that these are completely different than exponential functions. Cool. So we know what an exponential function is, but how would we determine its inverse? We can just follow the usual three steps from before. First, we swap the x and y in the equation, which gives us x equals to b to the power of y. Next, we need to make y the subject. Hmm. How are we supposed to do that? This is where logarithms come in. Logarithms are a useful method that allows you to make the exponent as a subject of this equation. And when we convert this to the logarithm form, we get the following, where y is now the subject. But how did that work out? This is the point at which if you haven't already, you should pause the video and go watch the logarithms video, which fully explains how they work and how to use them. If you've already watched it, let's move forward. As a refresher, here are the four log manipulation rules we looked at in the video. The slight difference now is that we don't have the term A as the main subject of the log, but it's pretty easy to adapt it. Regarding the values of B you're allowed to use, I mentioned that b has to be greater than 0 and can't be equal to 1. So all of those are things that we've already looked at before. You've seen exponential functions before and now you know about logarithms. The main thing is to connect the two and keep in mind that a logarithm is the inverse of an exponential function. We've already seen what the graphs of exponential functions look like, but we haven't seen what a logarithmic graph looks like and whether it can be considered a function. Let's sketch some of the graphs. Similarly to how you get different graphs of the exponential function depending upon the value of b, the shape of the log graphs also depends on the value of b. First case is for b is greater than 1. Let's take b as 4, giving the equation as y equals to log x base 4. The domain of this graph is x is greater than 0 because you can't have the log of a negative number. This is the graph produced. Let's put it through the vertical line test. The line never cuts the graph at more than one place, so it does qualify as a function. And since increasing x causes y to increase, 
it's an increasing function. Remember, we only came across logarithms because we we're trying to find the inverse for an exponential function. Which exponential function would give rise to an inverse of log x base 4? That would be 4 to the power of x. And plotting this together with the inverse graph from above gives these two graphs form a valid pair of function and inverse, and therefore earn the function notation. Let's think about the domain and range of these two functions. A function 4 to the power of x can take any x value, whether positive or negative, it doesn't really matter. So its domain would be all real numbers. But for its range, there is a restriction, which is that it can only have positive values. And that's because a positive number to the power of anything will always give a positive number, meaning a range of greater than zero. Then for the inverse function, its domain is restricted to only positive values of x because you can't take the log of a negative number or even zero for that matter. So this domain is x is greater than zero. But its range on the other hand can have any value, whether positive or negative, doesn't really matter. Provided you make the value of x small enough, you get as negative a y value as needed and you just have to make the x value really really large to make the y value very large as well. Meaning its range is all real numbers. Hopefully you've noticed some similarities between the domains and ranges of both functions. The domain of the function, meaning all real values, is the same as the range of the inverse. And the range of the function, meaning values greater than zero, is equal to the domain of the inverse, also values greater than zero. This is the rule I talked about earlier at the end of the quadratic function section, which was summarized by this diagram. Notice it's true for quadratic functions as well as exponential functions. It's true for linear functions as well. It was just harder to demonstrate then because the domain and the range of linear functions are both equal to all real numbers. That's why I didn't bring it up then. But just know that for all types of functions you've covered so far, as long as the function and its inverse are both valid functions, this rule is true. So we've looked at the graph for b values greater than 0, but what about for b values between 0 and 1? Let's see which graph you get using a b value of 0, 0,4. While we're at it, the exponential function that would produce this log is 0, 0,4 to the power of x. Plotting these two gives the following graph. And you get a nice symmetrical graph. And if you try the vertical line test by yourself, you see that the log equation qualifies as a function. And you can therefore write it all in function notation. And that is all there is to know about the graphs of exponential and log functions. The last part of this section, and by extension, the last theory in this video, is related to the basis of logarithms. At some earlier point, you've seen logs without a base, meaning just log x, this being the one you can type directly into your calculator and get a value. However, something you may not know is that this actually has a base of 10, and this is called the common logarithm. And the reason why the 10 base isn't shown in this form is because if you were to split this up into log x over log 10, log 10 is just 1. So as a denominator, it wouldn't really change the value and it would cancel off. Therefore, the 10 base doesn't really need to be shown. But there's also another sort of log which uses a specific base and this base is the base e, which is shortened to lin x. And this is called the natural logarithm. So this term is ln and it's pronounced as lin. So what is this e value that's being used as a base? It's a constant known as Euler's number. And it's an irrational number with a value slightly less than 2,72. The reason this special log was created in the first place is because it appears in a lot of hectic mathematical proofs and stuff. So it's worth defining it so there's a shortcut for it. I'll cover two examples so you can get a little practice with it. For the first, we have e to the power of 2x equals to 8, and we need to solve for x, which is in the exponent. And we know that the way to make the exponent as a subject is by changing it to log form, which gives 2x equals to log 8 base e, which by this method can be shortened to lin 8. Then you just take this to this side and divide the lin 8 by it and you can calculate x, finally giving you a value of 1,04. For the second example, we have lin x equals to 5. And again, we need to solve for x, 
we know that lin x represents a log with a base of e. And when we solve for x, this gives us e to the power of 5, which when you calculate it, you get a value of 148,41. And with that, we've reached the end of this pretty long functions video. Now I'll just summarize everything we've covered in the video. Firstly, a function is a rule which uniquely links numbers of one set A with numbers of another set B, with each number in A mapping to only one number in B. Then, functions can only be one-to-one -one or many-to-one -one relations. One-to-many relations aren't considered functions. The vertical line test lets you determine whether or not a relation is a function. How it works is, if you can draw a single vertical line that cuts the graph at more than one point anywhere along the graph's length, then it's not a function. Next, an inverse function written as f subscript negative 1 x does the reverse of a given function and it only exists for one-to-one -one functions. And how it's determined is by first swapping x and y in the original equation and making y the subject and finally expressing this in function notation. When you draw the graph of a function and its inverse, there'll be reflections of each other about the line y equals to x and any point on one of them that's reflected across the line y equals to x will be the same point except with the x and y coordinates switched around. So for example, a point 1 comma 8 on 1, the reflected point would have coordinates 8 comma 1. Next we looked at linear functions and linear functions have the form fx equals to ax plus q and all linear functions have an inverse. Then functions have the form fx equals to ax squared and these produce parabolic graphs which can be either a smile or a frown shape about a central axis of symmetry and in their basic form quadratic functions don't actually have an inverse function because the reflected graph doesn't pass the vertical line test but if you restrict the domain of the original function then this allows the inverse to also be a function and actually pass the vertical line test and the last functions we looked at were exponential functions and these come in the form of fx equals to b to the power of x and the inverse of these will be a logarithmic function with the form fx equals to log x base b and for all the different types of functions we looked at these being linear functions quadratic functions and exponential functions the following is true for the functions and the inverse function where the domain of the function will be equal to the range of the inverse and the range of the function be equal to the domain of the inverse. Lastly, we looked at two different types of logarithms which use different bases. So the first is a common logarithm, log x, which has a base 10, which is usually omitted. And then we looked at the natural logarithm, lin x, which is the same as saying log x with a base of e. And that's everything.